structure. And the uh, interesting aspect of this uh, structure is, first of all, that uh, the elastic energy disturbs the young teller distortion, because the elastic energy provokes a distortion which exists even before the young teller effect exists. And second, it's difficult to control the oxygen vacancies for reason due to basically the, the coordination, the high coordination number of the A side is quite easy to, to create vacancy. And this creates inherent disorder and valence fluctuations. Why? Because if you take out an oxygen, of course, this will affect the valence of the transition metal ions. And or, there's, or, this would, would, we would like to avoid this, especially because disorder and distortions, especially the oxygens, tend to screen the electric polarization produced by the B ions. So this uh, highly distorted structure is in fact weakens the polarization in simple perovskites. And uh, evidence for this is that if you consider various compounds with different substitutions, you have a very complex phase diagram of, with different competing magnetic structures and uh, which, which are unstable towards temperature changes or because, of course, the bandwidth is uh, uh, related to the, uh, to the size of, of, the, of, the chemi of, the, of the ions. So by varying uh, substitution and temperature, you may jump from one magnetic structure to the other. And uh, as a matter of fact, you, you have phase separation and, and the inherent electronic inhomogeneities. So what is special in quadrupole perovskites? Quadrupole perovskites have, first of all, they minimize the distortions. Why? Because the elastic energy associated with the strain is released through the fact that there is a second A prime site, which is Jan Teller also, and enable a, a, a large rigid buckling of the octahedra. So the buckling adjusts the, the distance between AO and BO without distorting the octahedra. So the young teller effect acts without the perturbation of the lattice distortion. Uh, also, this is a high symmetry structure and the oxygen sites cannot move very freely. So the distortion pattern is very limited. And also, because of the large tilt, the buckling of the, of the MNOBOB or MNOM angle is, um, is so large that this en enhances the next ne nearest neighbor exchange interaction because the structure is more compact. In fact, it is 20% larger as compared to simple proskites, which is a huge. So this distortion, this buckling, uh, enhances the density. So the, the pay to price is that uh, we have to synthesize this compound under high pressure. I will not go into the details, but because of the lower coordination number of this side, you cannot take out oxygens from this structure. So this structure is disorder free. So no disorder and uh, re re reduced uh, um, distortions. So we have to synthesize under high pressure. So the title here is high pressure synthesis. And this is the system which uh, we have developed my colleagues in Parma in my former laboratory. This is a, um, is a multi-anvil uh, device, multi-anvil press, which consists of uh, uh, a, a uniaxial press which acts on two distribution plates and uh, inside you have two sets of wedges which distribute the uniaxial force along various directions. In, in, we have been using the octahedral coordination so you have an octahedral uh, cell and so you have uh, eight faces and uh, 
So you can distribute very uniformly the, the, the force. And basically, this is a hydrostatic pressure. And uh, uh, up to 25 GPA, which is very interesting also for geophysical studies, by the way. And um, in our case, for our systems, we, we have been using quite mild uh, conditions, 4 GPA and 1,000 uh, and 1,000 Celsius. Just for those who are not familiar with uh, those pressures, and uh, my, my colleagues in, in Paris like to say that uh, one GPA is the pressure which you would obtain if you take the Eiffel Tower upside down and you apply the tower, if it was possible, onto a one euro coin, which is basically the same size as the one real coin. This is one GPA. So four GPAs, four Eiffel Towers upside down apply to one real. So this is an easier way to obtain this. And, um, but this is a really quite a robust uh, device. And the wedges are uh, stainless steel, the first one. And the second one is uh, um, tanks and carbide. Uh, which is uh, harder, but uh, uh, you could uh, use also, but more, much more expensive, Sinter Diamond. Um, with Sinter Diamond, we go, we go uh, higher. So usually they don't break because they are very expensive, so you would like to avoid to break them. But after some, if you, if you work at this pressure, you can repeat many, many experiments without breaking anything. <laughs> Uh, good point. The, in, in these mild conditions, you can use the larger uh, octahedra. So basically, you truncate eight, uh, the eight uh, cubes here along the one, one, one diagonal, and then you obtain an octahedral uh, space. Depending on how much you cut, you obtain a larger or smaller octahedral volumes. And in this case, the size of the sample is a, finally a cylinder of five millimeters by five. So it's quite big, uh, but uh, in the, these regimes, you have basically one millimeter by two. So, so you have uh, 300, 400 milligrams typically for this situation and then it's to this configuration, which is quite comfortable for various uh, types of measurements. And we obtain either single crystal or sintered powders with some impurity, which we could not avoid, but basically limited to 4 or 5%. And uh, just to show you a phase diagram, uh, which has been studied by my colleague uh, with a lot of experiment. This is one experiment. So uh, basically, you, you'll see in the pressure, pressure, this kilobar. So 10 kilobar is 1 gigapascal. Uh, so basically, the phase forms uh, starting from three or something, and this is temperature. So in the PT phase diagram, you see this the area of stability, and um, here you have a decomposition into these two phases. Indeed, we do find uh, often th this uh, this uh, impurity. This is a sodium, the sodium compound, but lant lanthanum is similar. And here you obtain this other Hausmannite, uh, MN304. Anyway, so this is, it requires a lot of work. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing that uh, the synthesis can be at low temperature also, four or 500 Celsius is enough. So this is to give you an idea of um, uh, the various morphology. You can obtain single crystals up to 0 0.5, 0 0.6 millimeters until now, and uh, uh, powders, depending on the, on the growth conditions. You, you have bigger crystals when you are near the phase decomposition. So just to summarize, simple perovskite versus quadruple perovskite. Simple perovskite have a large distortions 
the oxygen sites have a low symmetry, basically just the translational symmetry. I can, in, in crystallography, we say they are in the general position. So in, in bold, you have the, the free parameter. So this structure is more lousy. This structure is more rigid. You have basically, in fact, the one degrees of freedom, which is the angle of the tilt. So distortion is limited. Here is not. And um, this is really important to limit the screening of the polarization. So uh, we studied the magnetic uh, structure. So the title is magnetic structure in, in, uh, in lantern on manganese 7 or 2 or 12. We have as a function of temperature Bragg diffraction pattern. And at low temperature, we have the appearance of new peaks, which are the magnetic bar Bragg peaks, associated with the ordering of the B site and ordering of the A sites. And uh, so you, by refining the structure, you get basically, so you refine the intensity, the position of the magnetic Bragg peaks, this Bragg peak of the B site, this is the Bragg peak of the A prime site, and you obtain the, the component of the moment for the two sides. This is in, in uh, Bohr magnetons. And you dis discuss and you discover that this is a, a C type magnetic structure which uh, um, it's in the title. So C type, you remember, it's uh, anti magnetic plane coupled ferromagnetically. And uh, uh, here in, in, uh, in uh, the UFISCAR, we, we started last year uh, a study on the, on the ferroelectric property of this compound because we s thought that they could be uh, ferroelectric. And uh, these are, by the way, data better than the, the, the last one They're taken today. So you have uh, obtained the date. I think that the, the second query was taken at, uh, at uh, noon. And it shows that uh, uh, by varying the polarization, you have a remnant polarization, which is a fraction of microcoulomb per centimeter square. This is about 0 0.4 almost. But you see, by doubling the, the polarizing field, uh, you increase almost by two. So this means, these are preliminary data, that the polarization of the saturation is probably in the one micro Coulomb range. This is uh, the experiment performed by Flavio, Milton, and uh, Ducinet, Garcia. So we expect 10 times larger polarization in single crystals. This is a measurement of polycrystal. And second, we expect the, an even larger one because we didn't reach the saturation. So we can be conservative and say that we can get one microcoulomb, if not 10 microcoulomb per centimeter square. And the most relevant point of this data is that the ferroelectric transition occurs. In fact, this is quite broad transition, but if you look at the raw data of the ferroelectric current data, you see that the, the peak coincides with the nail temperature of the B ordering site. So this is a polarization induced by magnetism. And uh, in order to convince you about this, these are data of magnetization in zero field cooling and field cooling. This is the transition I just told, told you. This is the second transition of the A prime side. You see that this transition Magnetic coincides with the softening of Raman modes. I just here select the Raman mode, which is exactly the Jan Teller mode. So you see the link now between the role of the distortion induced by the Jan Teller effect and the appearance of ferroelectricity. And the further data taken at a low temperature by neutron diffraction. <coughs> 